Okay, ready when you guys are. Good afternoon. One man's trash is another man's treasure. The founder, Sam Snitzer, saw value in scrap where others saw waste. Snitzer's insight is being carried on through radius recycling 118 years later. Scrap metal is critical to the global economy. It has been a driving force for all human civilization, whether in transportation, manufacturing, or industrial. Today, scrap metal is building the future with an added emphasis on green infrastructure. Unfortunately, we believe that radius recycling is not strategically positioned to benefit from industry growth. Hello, my name is James Walker. Alongside Nico Caballero, Azad Barami, and Kenyon Hope, we issue a hold recommendation for radius recycling with a 12-month price target of $28.47, representing an 8.1% upside from close of January 2031st. Three elements formulate our investment recommendation. One, although we have seen significant growth in the electric arc furnace markets due to green infrastructure initiatives, a financially weakened radius is not positioned to benefit. Two, although demand for non-ferrous metals has increased as global economies have become more sustainable, current surpluses in the industry threaten long-term price growth. Three, radius recycling is experiencing margin compression due to rising scrap costs and falling metal prices. Radius recycling is headquartered in Portland, Oregon, and has 100 locations and 50 facilities located along the west coast, with a presence in the northeast and southeast. They have grown to become an international player, conducting business in India, China, and Malaysia. They are a third-party recycling scrap service that operates with industrial companies, retailers, and manufacturers. They operate in a circular economy, taking end-of-life scrap and refining it into finished metals. They have four revenue segments, ferrous, non-ferrous, steel, and retail known as pick and pull. Thanks, James. The recycling metals and the electric arc furnace produced steel market's overall profitability and growth are driven by worldwide steel production, the supply of industrial level scrap, and the growth of carbon emission legislation. Worldwide profitability has suffered from an increase in the amount of subsidized Chinese steel exports affecting the gold price of steel. Domestically, price hikes for green steel products in 2023 were the result of a $60 per ton increase in the price of scrap metals. This price increase was the result of headwinds in the space constraining the flow from normal scrap. According to Corey Spalding of Spalding Auto Parts, who has over 10 years of experience in the industry, the normal flow from end-of-life automobiles was affected by interest rates, high inflation, and a lack of innovation in the automotive space, causing consumers to hold on to their used vehicles for longer. Our first investment driver is Radius's position as an integral piece to the overall puzzle of a greener, cleaner steel industry. The steel industry is expected to transition to electric arc furnaces as it presents a more sustainable solution to producing steel than the traditional blast furnace. Global production from electric arc furnaces is supposed to grow by 10% over the next five years, driven by China and India, which make up over half of the current total blast furnace market. Radius stands to benefit from electric arc furnaces purely ferrous usage inputs compared to blast furnaces lower ferrous usage. Radius's high recovery rates and their large network of pick and pull lots will drive profitability in its ferrous and steel segments. However, Radius is not fully positioned to take advantage of this transition in the industry because its low earnings and high debt from its credit revolver to fund recent acquisitions has left its financial position less flexible and adaptable. Our second investment driver is the forecasted demand for non-ferrous metals from renewable energy source growth. Global and domestic sustainability initiatives like the Paris Accords, the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act will lead to market growth for wind and solar power, which are the two most metal-intensive energy sources. The International Energy Agency projects this market to double by 2028, with China accounting for 56% of this growth. This represents a tripling of current capabilities and will necessitate large amounts of non-ferrous metals, namely copper and aluminum. The current surpluses in mining production of these metals will be outpaced by this future demand, subsequently raising the prices of these metals. Reyes's higher non-ferrous volumes from its advanced metal recovery technology and its acquisition of advanced shredders by Encore and Cascade will enable it to fulfill this need for high quality non-ferrous metals in the market. However, the non-ferrous metal market is highly affected by renewable energy source growth, a market that remains speculative in future forecasting, causing concerns for the reliability of these price increases. Further, technology growth in the renewable energy space and the continued addition in China's copper ore refining capacity pose threats.
Our final investment driver supporting our whole recommendation is Radius's gross margin volatility paired with time to data operating margin. Its elevated operating leverage can be attributed to its lack of vertical integration relative to its regional peers and its preference to refrain from hedging its commodity exposure. With Radius and its property and image spread between unprocessed and processed metals, it tends to have favorable margins as their commodity prices are stable or rising. We forecast Radius's gross margin through a series of Monte Carlo simulations which captures the commodity pricing volatility that Radius faces, the metal spread, and Radius' ability to efficiently turn over physical goods. These investment drivers now bring us to our validation, where we analyze Radius recycling using a free cash flow firm, discounted capital model, and a relative valuation as a confirmer. Our target price is a weighted average of three different scenarios to capture Radius' intrinsic value over a bear, base, and bull market. In our base scenario, on average, we have net income profit of 3% on a revenue decline of 1%, and we estimate the price of bearish to increase 2% on an annual basis with the volatility pricing to its gross margin. For our bear and bull scenario, we estimate a revenue decline of 5% on average, and for a bull, an increase of 5% on revenue. So we established a bottom-up approach to derive our pro forma, driven by commodity pricing and volumes. For commodity pricing, we forecast them through a series of multi-regression analysis and identifying which macroeconomic variables have the strongest relationship to its relative commodity. For bearish pricing, we identify that the strongest correlation between global GDP, global CPI, and steel manufacturing orders. For non-bearish metals, global GDP, global CPI. And finally, for the price of steel, the strongest relationship came from the price of revenue. For radius and volumes, we forecasted them at the growth rate of domestic vehicle sales, as the majority of their scrap comes from EFI vehicles. The strongest relationship came from Radius's volumes offset of 22 years, and we also implemented the impact that Radius will face as the average age of vehicles continues to increase in 12 year time period. To account for free cash flows past our forecast rising, we estimate a terminal growth rate of 2%. Thanks, Nico. Radius has a triple A MSCI ESG rating and leads the industry in environmental sustainability with its innovative green filter <coughs> generating zero carbon emissions. The business has invested over $224 million in various environmental systems and projects. They reduced emissions by 25%, lead the industry in recycled water usage, and transition 7% of sunlight equipment to alternative power sources. However, these projects have been overshadowed by continued environmental disasters. Radius is inclusive and diverse, comparable to the other companies in the industry, with a mix of 47% black, indigenous people of color, compared to the industry average of 43%. Radius is a <coughs> director is staggered to three-year term. 77% of Radius is owned by institutional investors. Radius operates in a dynamic market with several external factors that pose potential threats to its profitability and stability. Today, we'll discuss two key risks, China tariffs and pollution impacts. China's national sorting initiative restricts imports of low-quality recyclables, impacting U.S. exports. Now, restrictive contamination rules, which the U.S. rarely meets, further complicate exports to China. The industry faces strict environmental regulations in regards to waste management and emissions. Radius is no exception. Clean Water Act violations in several states recently resulted in a 2.2 million settlement for Radius. Between 2018 and 2023, the business experienced six fires involving hazardous materials that led to product risk, operation disruptions, repair costs, and regulatory penalties. While Radius takes steps to address these risks, ongoing concerns remain. In conclusion, based on our con comprehensive analysis of Radius and its market, we recommend a hold with a target price of $28.47, representing an upside of 8.9%. Thank you, and now we'd like to open up the floor for questions. Great job, guys. Yeah, we'll open up to the three judges. So their dividends was um, hasn't been increasing that much. They are they're mostly a uh, um, used new grip and dividend the stock was, their last increase was in 2012, fiscal year 2012. They increased it from eight cents to 75 cents a year. 
Um, and <clears throat> with their recent earnings, we have been thinking that they might not be able to cover this dividend, especially their um, debt to um, their high interest rate ratio. Not necessarily. I do believe if you can go to um, different capital firms. Um, so one of the things that comes with Vegas is that they're, they generate um, quite a significant amount of um, cash within our forecast period. And that's driven through a mid cycle um, as that's mainly how companies with cyclical business are, are priced into. So we do believe that they'll be able to meet uh, the revolver by 20, 27 as they're going to have a, roughly around 10% remaining and assuming they're going to be able to roll it over uh, into their period. But that revolver does give them flexibility to be able to pay their dividend as right now they've only utilized $285 million relative to the 800, 300 million outstanding that they're able to use. So are they on fixed debt or do they have a pause or interest rate? Spent for uh, 80 million of their total 230 million that they've taken out from their credit revolver. They also took out a fixed interest rate swap on the other 150 million that they've taken out so far from their revolver at a rate of 4.4 percent. Do you know when those? Do you know when those interest rate swaps roll over? Yeah, the last day is meaning 2026 when when it's not going to see it. Yeah, and then the revolver uh, ends 2027. Okay, I just have one last question. Um, so did I hear you guys correctly? So it's so you guys spoke with somebody in the management Spalding. Yeah, we is that a local with, company? Yeah, so um, Spalding Auto Parts is a uh, pick and pull lot here in Spokane, akin to what Radius operates through for its auto pick and pull lot. And we spoke to them about the process of acquiring auto or end of life automotives and about how the industry has been affected. Yeah, I think that's great. Doing grassroots research, that's pretty cool. And one of the key takeaways was that the pricing power that Radius does have over its suppliers, as he says, um, the Spalding Auto Parts is a very cash generated uh, cycle. So as soon as they have end of life vehicles that are no longer used, and then customers are no longer pulling parts, they just go to Radius and um, they give a market reference rate minus some to get their what would be their gross margin or their operating margin for uh, Radius recycling kind of go off of Nico as well. The big reason why Spalding Auto Parts does this is because they don't want to keep those end of life vehicles that have no more use for their customers to take parts from anymore. So they want to sell it and create as much inventory turnover with that scrap metal as they can. So with Southeast Asia flooding the market of cheap steel, radius polluting and having fires in all their factories, if they were shut down tomorrow, do you think anybody would miss them?
Yes, um, absolutely. So two things um, to take away from their management is one, since the takeover of the CEO, um, we've seen a total shareholder um, return of negative. Um, however, some benefits that specifically come with that CEO is her past experience with the president um, as she served on the board of foreign affairs with business negotiations. So we see um, a potential benefit um, if Donald Trump were to be elected because she already served on his board um, with future business in that regard. Did I hear you guys correctly that, did you say that the demand for renewables in terms of future growth is perhaps not <coughs> I just thought I heard you guys say that renewables will not be a growth market going forward. And if that is, well, why is that? Yeah, so I can see that question. Yeah, so I said that the growth market for renewable energy, especially or specifically in India and China, is speculative in nature. Uh, while they are committing themselves to the Paris Accords, they are making a target date of 2030 to have their highest carbon emission output. So that means that while they are trying to overall change their economy to a more sustainable solution by building an infrastructure, that means though that they are not necessarily required to, within our forecast period, make a marked development towards this. And we can also see on this graph here, both India and China have raised their overall carbon output in the past couple of years compared to the USA. And so that's why we believe that the uh, current over our forecast period uh, renewable energy growth is speculative about how much China will actually uh, be able to institute in this country. Okay, thanks. Do you guys see regulatory risk increasing? So um, we have seen, for regulations, we've seen um, a tariff war between the Trump administration and China. Um, in the current press conference, Trump did say that he is um, looking into increasing tariffs specifically on steel um, for that regard. Yeah, and he's planning on implementing at least a 60% tariff, uh, as he's mentioned, and this has really been driven by the steel industry in the United States in the electric car component, especially moving forward. And is that a tariff on imports? Is that gonna help us? Yeah, those are the tariffs on imports coming from China. As because one of the biggest things that come to China, they're able to produce cheap Chinese steel products that are lower quality and they subsidize it. So they subsidize it their own steel and then therefore uh, kind of disturbing the market in the United States. Tariff war kind of be a, a risk for this industry, this company being in the tariff war in Asia. Yeah, and uh, in the earlier slide, I did talk about the China's national sword policy, and that was China's response in back in 2018 when they initiated this uh, policy to start it, and possibly with Trump's uh, election, they could be seeing more tariffs upon their imports. Good. Well, that is time, but. Uh, Awesome job, guys, and that was a really good presentation and, and well uh, well performed. So thank you, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Awesome job. And then we'll see you guys. At yeah, we're gonna get all the grades together, and then we'll see you at Brick West probably about four thirty. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Would you like me to sign out, Ryan? Uh, I'll do that right now. Yeah, thank you. <coughs>